everybody. Uh, this is John from John's Record Collection. This is box number three, uh, which starts with Les Baxter. It's in the letter B's, and it starts with Les Baxter and ends with Black Murda. So uh, let's take a look at what's inside the box. First in the box is Les Baxter. So if you're one of the Exotica fans, uh, this is probably the tape for you. Uh, so I have a bunch of my Baxter LPs uh, right at the beginning of this box. And uh, to tell you the truth, I probably have more albums by Les Baxter than anybody else. Uh, I used to find a lot of them when I would go to garage sales and look for records that I could find for cheap. And um, there was a lot of... Uh, Les Baxter records that I could find back in the day. So let's take a look at some of them. So this one, this one was not a garage sale find. This is one of the rarer uh, Les Baxter's. It's uh, uh, it's the soundtrack to the horror film The Dunwich Horror. And uh, I guess it, it looks like the title is Music of the Devil God Cult. But it's... Uh, it's, uh, it says, from the original soundtrack of the American International Motion Picture, The Dunwich Horror, this is the original press on American International Records. American International uh, was kind of a trashy production company that did a lot of horror movies and did a lot of, of those biker movies in the 60s, a lot of youth culture movies, a lot of those Roger Corman movies. Uh, so it's, it, it's definitely very collectible as far as the soundtracks are concerned. And uh, this guy on the front cover, uh, that's actually uh, character actor Harry Dean Stanton. So he was he had a starring role in The Dunwich Horror, and that's why he's on the front cover. And uh, on the back here, there's a very... Uh, so The Dunwich Horror is an H.P. Lovecraft story, and they have a little illustration here on the back that, uh, uh, you know, gives you a sense of the Lovecraftian uh, contents therein. Uh, so uh, this, is a, this is a heavily uh, electronic music record, uh, which is a testament to Les Baxter's uh, versatility, uh, as you will see. But uh, uh, any version of this is relatively difficult to find. Uh, even the reissues of it, uh, which came out, I guess, in the 70s or 80s on uh, Verace Sarabound, that's a, a soundtrack uh, reissue label. Uh, those are uh, difficult to find as well. Uh, some of those even have a cooler cover because the, the, the reissue cover actually uh, has this on the front cover, the, the, the uh, cartoon of the uh, many tentacled monster attacking the woman. And uh, let's see. Ah, yes. Les Baxter's Jewels of the Sea. Uh, this is very much, uh, uh, he tried to go for a sort of underwater sound and a lot of uh, uh, theremins uh, and uh, just uh, very sort of otherworldly, under the sea kind of sound. So uh, Les Baxter was a very very talented arranger uh, and composer, uh, and so a lot of his um, albums are very soundscape-like. They create a picture uh, in your mind of a different place, and so the, the, this particular album focuses on making you feel like you're being under the sea, and uh, so um, it's called Jewels of the Sea. And it's uh, one of the high points of uh, Les Baxter's. Okay, this is this is another uh, record, uh, Moog Rock. So this is another. Uh, it's pronounced Moog, it, even though it's spelled M-O-O-G. It's pronounced Moog, and the way to remember it is the rogue is in vogue who pronounces it Moog. Uh, anywho, um, this is a copy of. Uh, I used to have, I think this was an upgrade for the copy I had, so this is actually a sealed copy, but I've, I've heard this uh, uh, record several times. Uh, it, um, there is a, um, there's a really great um, um, 
song on this uh, Rachmaninoff's Prelude in C sharp minor, which is played on a mode synthesizer, and uh, it, it, it was uh, sampled on a BC Boy song. I think it was sampled on Intergalactic. So it's a, it's a, uh, definitely a very nice record if you like uh, Moog uh, keyboard sounds. Uh, and let's see, what other. Oh, this is a great exotica, a classic exotica. Obviously, you see the, the uh, uh, you know, um, very beautiful cover model with lots of references to exotic places. So, this is Ports of Pleasure uh, with Les Baxter and his chorus and orchestra. And uh, so, uh, the titles are meant to uh, evoke what it's like to be on exotic sea cruise. So there are titles like Tahiti, Summer Night at Sea, Hong Kong Cable Car, uh, Tramp Steamer to Singapore, City of Vales, Monkey Dance of Bali, etc. etc. And uh, here, here is another uh, Les Baxter, very exotic cover. Uh, this is a painted cover, so there's no model on it. Uh, but it's uh, Les Baxter's Ritual of the Savage, uh, or uh, I guess in French, Le Sacre du Savage. Uh, did I pronounce that right? And uh, so this is uh, very much trying to give you sort of a generic jungle, uh, jungle exotic sound experience. Uh, so that, that's what uh, you're in for. Oh, here's another one. This is, so this is trying to give you sort of a, a Mexican, South American, uh, Inca flavor. It's Les Baxter, the sacred idol. So, um, you know, great cover photo of, uh, I guess, a uh, Mayan or Incan. Uh, uh, no, no, actually it was Aztec. So these are Aztec sculptures uh, on the front cover. And Here's another one. Uh, this one is more uh, bongos. Uh, in the 1950s, bongos got to be popular with the beat generation and the beatnik movement. And uh, so this is Skins, Bongo Party with Les, Les Baxter, uh, trying to cash in on trends from the 1950s. But as you can see, already Les Baxter is a very, very prolific guy and impressive for that. And, uh, Let's see. I have some more Les Baxters. Uh, Tambu. Uh, Les Baxter, his chorus and orchestra. Another uh, very exotic painting uh, on the front cover. Uh, this is trying to go with a more uh, Haitian uh, Creole flavor, uh, although um, or a more Caribbean flavor. Uh, but they're also trying to, uh, you know, throw in some African, African rhythms in there too. And here, oh, this is this is very good, uh, very nice cover, uh, very very uh, sort of one of the wholesomely sexy uh, 1950s cover models. Les Baxter's Wild Guitar. Uh, so it more uh, they're trying to uh, advertise a more flamenco feel on this one. So that's uh, that's all my Les Baxter, uh, but uh, man, I have uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight. I have, at least, I have a eight Les Baxter records, uh, as far as I know, and uh, that may be more than I have uh, of any other artist. Uh, here, uh, Bach meets the Beatles. I like, uh, I like, um, I like, um, Albums that uh, have Beatles songs on them. And uh, the Beach Boys Christmas album. And now, this is a very interesting one. This is from a cartoon in the early 1960s called The Beagles. And they, it was a cartoon that tried to cash in on the Beatles with a T. Uh, so, it, so it's on a budget label called Harmony. So it's the kind of thing that they tried to 
trick people into buying because it sounded like the Beatles, but wasn't exactly the Beatles. The thing is, the songs on this are actually really good. It's very, like, Beatlesque pop that's sung by these two cartoon dogs. And it's actually quite uh, good. Uh, let's see, some of my favorites on here, uh, there's, like, Sharing Wishes, which is, like, this love song about doing the dishes with the person you love. Uh, uh, Indian Love Dance, uh, I Joined the Foreign Legion. Uh, yeah, there's some really interesting Beatlesque pop on this record. And uh, so um, I, I often uh, like to buy a lot of records associated with cartoons, uh, partially because they, they, they can be very hard to find in good condition because they were usually sold as children's records, and children don't necessarily treat their records very well. Uh, but also, uh, a lot of these songs were viewed as disposable at the time, but they're actually very, very good. And, and things that were usually viewed as disposable at the time uh, often go up in value because people didn't take good care of them. And so when you do find a good copy, it might be worth something. Um, uh, this one, I think I found it... I might have found this in a record store, a used bookstore in Oregon, of all places, but it's a ancient Hawaiian musical instrument uh, featuring Nona Beamer. So uh, I was interested in this because I like to collect records with a lot of different unusual instruments on them, and uh, so one sub subgenre I collect is prehistoric instruments, and uh, so these are uh, ancient Hawaiian instruments. So. Uh, that was the reason I got this record. And let's see. Oh, uh, this one's cheap, but it's so good. It's a KTEL compilation from the 1980s called The Beat. And uh, I like it because uh, if you're into 1980s new wave, it's a cheap way to get a lot of tracks that you don't see. So there's like a very early, um, uh, there's a very early uh, Depeche Mode track that was made when they were like only one or two years old as a band. Uh, it's um, Dreaming of Me, Dreaming of Me by Depeche Mode. But it, it also has some of the more new wave hits like uh, Flock of Seagulls, A Ran So Far Away, Kim Wilde, Kim, Kids in America. Uh, but they also have some more obscure stuff on here. Let's see, what's some obscure stuff? Uh, Joan of Arc, uh, Orchestral Maneuvers in the Dark. So that was an English-only hit. And it wasn't really a hit in the United States. Uh, and uh, I Got You by Split Ends. Uh, really good uh, new wave power pop song. I Predict by Sparks. You Hit the Spot by Graham Parker. So some of these, uh, some of these uh, new wave stuff is actually more uh, obscure because uh, this was put out by KTEL, the company that advertised, um, you know, compilations on TV, and so once they got the hits, they could kind of put in whatever they wanted for the rest of the stuff, as long as it was cheap, and so every once in a while, you have a KTEL compilation that's really good, and this is one of those good uh, KTEL compilations, so if you are looking for a good 1980s new wave compilation, uh, this is one that was a compilation when 1980s new wave was still going on, and it's, it's actually better than some of the retrospective 1980s new wave compilations that they do now, so uh, to beat. So it's a cheap one, and so if you find it, definitely get it. And uh, let's see, uh, this is a, uh, this is kind of a reissue compilation, uh, beat, uh, picture, beat jazz, uh, pictures from the God world. Uh, this is a uh, compilation, I think, that was done in the 1990s, a lot of beatnik era stuff. A lot of the stuff on this compilation is stuff you can't get any other way unless you were, like, spent, like, hundreds or perhaps even thousands of dollars. So uh, this compilation is a good starting point. Uh, and... Oh, the beat of Tahiti, exotic rhythms of Tahiti. 
So I think this was another uh, garage sale find of an Exotica record for me. So uh, this is definitely, definitely something nice. And uh, Beat of the Traps, uh, this is another weird compilation from the 1990s. Uh, Beat of the Traps is a compilation of songs from the MSR label. MSR was an unusual uh, label that allowed people to send in poems and they would get paid for sending people's poems to music. And the thing is, because it was a money-making operation, they didn't turn anybody down. So there are some really, really weird poems that they have sent to music and um, so some of them are on this compilation. And, oh, I guess the bees have a lot of nice, nice exotica records. Beat Tropical, Latin Rhythms, and Savage Drum Fantasy. Uh, a little bit of a, I guess, a nudie drawing on the cover, which, uh, uh, if you can find any of those nudie, <laughs> any, if there's any nudity on a 1950s album, it's usually usually somebody trying to collect it uh, for obvious reasons. So uh, definitely something to look out for. Um, and, oh, this is a cool cover. It actually sounds good, too. Uh, this is uh, the Beetle Buddies. Fabulous Beetle sound. So this is a an all-female group that were brought into a studio to record a Beatles cash-in album. So, so in 1964, when the Beatles, uh, you know, got ridiculously popular with uh, Beatlemania, there was uh, a huge untapped demand for stuff that sounded like the Beatles. And as a result, there were a lot of budget labels, cheapo budget labels, that would record a lot of bands that uh, looked or sounded like the Beatles, and they and they market them with really misleading names and partially they did that so that somebody's mom or somebody's grandma you know would give somebody like a record as a gift uh, and the kid would think he's getting the Beatles but instead the kid gets gypped because it's not really the Beatles and so you know it was pretty bad uh, if you were a kid in 1964 and that happened to you but the thing is from a collector standpoint some of these records are actually good because they sound like the Beatles and the Beatles are good so at least they tried to sound like somebody good instead of imitating somebody who sucks so uh, anyway, the Beatle Buddies, so it, especially if you like all female bands, I like to collect all female bands, all women bands too. Uh, this is definitely an early example of that that's a good one to collect. So here, here are some stuff that I just put in uh, uh, for B for Beatle, but I don't know where else to put them because I cannot read the foreign language that's on the record. So this is an Israeli record of Beatles songs. You can kind of tell more it's Beatles because you've got the drawings of the Beatles on the back cover, but it's all in Hebrew. Uh, and uh, so it's, uh, it's a collection of, uh, uh, of Beatles songs uh, for children that are in Hebrew. And uh, it's sold in Israel. And this one, this one is an album from Thailand I could not read the letters on this for the life of me, but the one reason I have it is because they have, there is a Beatles song, I believe it's Hey Jude, that is sung in Thai on this record. I like to collect uh, Beatles covers, and one of the sub-sub-genres of Beatles covers I like to collect uh, are uh, Beatles covers that are in a foreign language. So this is it. This is uh, from Thailand, and it's sung in Thai. And here, here is an album called. It's just called Beatlemania. This one is all Spanish. So it has a bunch of. Uh, it's a compilation. That it was a compilation made in the 1960s. So it was made at the time that the Beatles were still active. 
and uh, it has a bunch of sort of generic Mexican bands, Los Novels, Los Americans, Los, Las Bestias, Las Thunderbirds, uh, a bunch of other, um, a bunch of other uh, Mexican bands, and uh, uh, basically it's all, um, it's all uh, Beatles songs in Spanish. So actually, uh, I found that if you're looking for Beatles covers in foreign languages, uh, Spanish and French uh, generally tend to be the easiest to find, uh, mainly because there's a lot of Beatles covers that were done in Spanish in Mexico, and there were a lot of uh, Beatles covers done in French in, um, in Quebec, in Francophone Canada. So uh, those seem to be the easiest to find if you're looking for foreign language uh, Beatles covers. And uh, this one, this one is a Beatles, a Beatles, uh, Beatles tribute band. Uh, this is Beatles songs in Deutsch by the Beatles revival band of Frankfurt. So this one is a, an album that is all Beatles songs, but they're all done in German. So uh, that's definitely something I like. Uh, just what it says on the tin, Beatles songs in Deutsch. And uh, this this is a uh, Beatles songs. This is a compilation of songs about the Beatles. So it's not a compilation of Beatles songs. It's a compilation of novelty songs about the Beatles that was put out by uh, Rhino Records, uh, the reissue and uh, comedy label. It's actually kind of funny. Um, let's see. There is a Beatle rap on this record. So there's a rap by the Quarry Men, Q W O R Y N E N, uh, called Beatle Rap. Uh, there's also some of the uh, some more classic stuff like uh, the Carefreeze, We Love You Beatles, Donna Lynn, My Boyfriend Got a Beatle Haircut, uh, uh, Alan Sherman, Pop Hates the Beatles. So a lot of the novelty records about the Beatles that were very common in 1964 and 1965. Uh, another, <laughs> another album of Beatles songs, uh, Beatles uh, cover versions. And then this one, okay, this one, I think, oh, okay, so I found it at Amoeba Records in uh, Berkeley, so it still has the price tag on it. So this is Folk Songs for Taxpayers by Mimi B uh, by, with Rhett Fink and the Folk Mix. So uh, this is a, a, a right-wing parody of 1960s folk music and it was put on Key Records. Key Records is very interesting because it was a record label that was owned by the John Birch Society uh, the, the far-right group in the early to mid-1960s. So occasionally you can find some really bizarre music and bizarre spoken word records on the key records label uh, because it's associated with the John Hurt Society. Uh, let's see. Oh, this is, this is, the, here is a really great group. I should probably show you all the albums I have by them. I don't have all of their albums, but uh, this is uh, the Bo Brummels. So this is the Bo Brummels' Bradley's Barn. It was a later album by them, but it is considered one of the first country rock albums. Um, this is the debut album by the Bo Brummels. So the Bo Brummels... Uh, they were known, they had two top 40 hits in the 1960s. One was called Laugh Laugh, and the other one was called Just a Little. And they're kind of a moody folk rock group. And uh, they're just, they just look like a classic 60s group. And one reason they look like a classic 60s group is that when Tom Hanks uh, did the movie That Thing You Do, which was about sort of a generic 60s group that had a one-hit wonder, uh, he based a lot of what the group dressed like and had haircuts like based on the Bull Brummels. 
So that's, uh, but the Bo Brummels were actually a very good group uh, in their own right, uh, not just the hits they had. Um, here is another one. This is, this is a concept album. So the Bo Brummels did two things that were relatively innovative for their time. They did a country rock record, and before that they did a concept album, which uh, uh, weren't uh, very common until uh, the Beatles uh, popularized concept albums with the Sgt. Pepper's Lonely Hearts Club Band. So this is one of the, the albums that uh, the Bo Brummels did as a concept album. And so that's my Bo Brummels records, and... Let's see. Okay. Oh, this is a good one. Ragnarok Electronic Funk. Uh, this is by Beaver and Kraus. Beaver and Kraus uh, are an electronic music duo. And uh, this, is, this is one of their early albums. Some people don't like it, but I really like it. It's, it's, uh, it's a very fresh uh, electronic sound that's from like 1968 or 1969. So it actually sounds a little ahead of its time. Uh, in fact, there were some tracks on here that almost reminded me of the Depeche Mode <laughs> tracks that I saw on, you know, that I would hear on the 1980s New Wave compilations. It's a it's really interesting record, in my opinion. And, uh, well, the haters can just, you know, they can just suck it. Uh, anyway, the, uh, here's another one. This is Beaver and Krauss, The Nonsuch Guide to Electronic Music. And, uh, so this is a two-record set. Uh, this one isn't as, uh, well, it isn't as musical, it's more of an instruction album that teaches people uh, what electronic music sounds like, and they do all these, um, you know, they, they, they tell how this is the way sine waves work, and this is the way, so this is a more spoken word plus electronic record, but that's what's cool about it. Um, let's see what else we have in here. Oh, this is a really great soundtrack. Be Dazzled. So if you're into that Austin Powers aesthetic, uh, Bedazzled uh, has some really good, really good uh, songs on its soundtrack. It's incredibly good. Um, uh, it's also a hilarious movie. Uh, if you see the, six, the original 60s version of this uh, movie, it is hilarious. Uh, watch the original. Uh, I'm told the remake with uh, Elizabeth Hurley and uh, was it Hugh Grant and Hugh Elizabeth Hurley or uh, no, it was Brendan Fraser and Elizabeth Hurley. So that was the remake, but I'm told that's not as good. But the, the original is hilarious. Um, if you like that kind of uh, proto Monty Python humor, and uh, but it also has a lot of uh, jazzy and psychedelic and mod, Austin Powers-ish instrumentals, and so it's a really great soundtrack. And this one, this one is, uh, is, is uh, the BJ Family Album. So, I guess not a lot of, the, the BJ Family Album, sorry, my my face is covered by the record. So the BJ Family album, uh, it's a record label called BJ. I think it was out in Florida somewhere. And uh, basically all it does is it's, a, it's like an audition record for a bunch of lounge bands. So there's some very interesting cover versions on this record. Uh, let me let me take a look at them because I, I need to jog my memory here. But uh, yeah, so there's a uh, there's a cover version of the Who's Pinball Wizard. There's a cover version of Stevie Wonder's Superstition. Uh, there's a, uh, a a band that covers both Frank Zappa's Dancing Fool and the Beatles' Eleanor Rigby. So yeah, the, the cover choices on here are absolutely insane, and. Uh, Let's see, uh, there's a, 
Oh, there's, some, there's a band here that does Stairway to Heaven. I mean, I'm telling you, the cover choices on this record are insane. Uh, oh, and there's another one that does a cover version of Roundabout by Yes. I mean, I told you, I told you the cover choices on this record are absolutely insane. So it's called the BJ Family Album. Unfortunately, there's a little you know, tear on the front cover, but I don't care. I mean, the, the, the covers on this are just absolutely and I didn't pay much money for this. So, uh, really, <laughs> I don't know if you'll ever find it, you know, because it's hard to find, but nobody else is looking for it, so I got it cheap. So, that's that's one of the keys. So, if you want rare stuff, you want to find rare stuff that uh, nobody else is looking for, because you can get it cheaper. You know, supply and demand. Uh, so, uh, this one here is a record by Captain Beefheart and the Magic Man. Magic Band, Captain Beefheart and the Magic Band, did I almost say Magic Man? Uh, so Captain Beefheart and the Magic Band, lick my decals off, baby. Uh, Captain Beefheart is a major cult artist, uh, mainly associated with Frank Zappa, uh, but uh, a lot of his records are good, so um, um, he's kind of a weird, mutant, avant-garde blues guy who sings with a really gravelly voice. Uh, so if that's your thing, you, you know, you might want to check them out. Um, so this is, uh, Lick My Decals Off Baby, uh, which is one of his better records. And I also have his debut record, Safe As Milk. And, uh, so this is kind of a bluesy, this is a more street blues garage record, or a more blues garage version of his sound, but, uh, it's, it's quite good. Uh, John Lennon was actually a big fan of this record, and he had a sticker. He had a Safe as Milk sticker uh, in his house uh, that uh, is in uh, a John Lennon photo. So John Lennon was a big fan of this, and, you know, I think John Lennon's seal of approval is a pretty good, uh, pretty reliable. Um, let's see. Oh, my God. Classic 60s soul, Archie Bell and the Drells. Uh, they are best known for the song Tighten Up, uh, which they had a number one hit with. You know, hi, I'm Archie Bell. These are my Drells. Do, 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 do. Uh, and anyway, but this, uh, this is not the one with the number one hit on it, but it's, I mean, pretty much all their records are good. If, you know, if he, if he wasn't good, Late 60s soul, Archie Bell and the Drells. You know, we'll fill the bill for you. And, uh, let's see. Some belly dancing music. I have a lot of belly dancing records. Um, Virginia Belmont. This is another uh, bird, bird sound record. Uh, so occasionally you get some weird records uh, with people with bird calls on them or... Or I think she was a lady that uh, would actually like whistle and sing with her own birds. Uh, you know, you can kind of tell she's like one of those dippy, uh, dippy uh, ladies that once she got money, she would do weird stuff. Um, and uh, oh, this is a very good psychedelic lounge record. Very nice um, sort of micro dot. Uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, if you can see the group, it's in micro dots. Uh, the name of the group is the Iris Bell Adventure. Uh, there's a very good, uh, uh, they have very good in, uh, original songs on this, but they also have a really good uh, cover version of Aquarius, Let the Sunshine In, and I'm, I'm a big fan <laughs> of uh, cover versions of Aquarius. Um, Vinnie Bell, Vinnie Bell, Pop Goes the Electric Sitar. So I like a lot of raga pop and raga rock and a lot of stuff with uh, 1960s pop and 1960s rock music with sitar uh, added to it. Uh, this is Vinnie Bell. He invented, so Vinnie Bell or Vincent Bell is a very famous session guitarist 
And he was also a bit of a gearhead or an engineer type who invented many different types of guitars. And one of the types of guitars he invented was the electric sitar, which was associated with a, com a company called Dan Electro. So he, it's called the Dan Electro Electric Sitar. And if you can find an original one of those electric sitars, those are pretty expensive too. Uh, but um, this is uh, Pop Goes the Electric Sitar. Uh, and it was mainly uh, put out uh, partially so they could sell more of those electric sitars, but it's, it's, a, it's a very good record, uh, nonetheless. So, um, and this is a really good one. I found this at the old, old Heine's Records. Well, Heine's Records is still around, but this was in an older location of Heine's uh, Records in Minneapolis that I found it. But it's the Soundtronic Guitar of Vincent Bell. So the same guy, and uh, it, it's uh, a very good uh, 50s era guitar record, late 50s, early 60s era guitar record, which has a lot of electronic gadgetry uh, on the guitars. Uh, so uh, definitely pre-psychedelic, but very, very interesting sort of electric, electronic guitar sound that is influenced by Vinnie Bell's both mastery of the guitar and also mastery of how to uh, create these crazy electronic rigs for the guitars to make it sound unusual. Um, uh, uh, Bells of Indiana and IU Jazz Ensemble. I mainly, uh, it's a great cover. I mainly got this because there's a feel song on it. Um, Ah, Beneath the Planet of the Apes. So, uh, so this is uh, from the sequel to Planet of the Apes, one of the sequels of the Planet of the Apes, Beneath the Planet of the Apes. Uh, that's the sequel where, you know, there are these uh, crazy people living underground and they worship a nuclear weapon. Uh, yeah, so uh, this, is the, this is the Planet of the Apes soundtrack to get. Uh, I don't know if I even here to get a copy of the original Planet of the Apes. This is the one that has, you know, kind of psychedelic, uh, psychedelic music on it, but it also has a lot of weird uh, sound clips of dialogue. So I like soundtrack records that give you both the music and a little bit of weird dialogue to it, and this, this is definitely something that fits bill in that regard. Uh, and then... Kathy Berberian. Revolution. So Kathy Berberian was a classically trained opera singer. She was the wife of an avant-garde composer named Luciano Berio. Uh, and uh, she uh, did an album called Revolution, uh, which was a Revolution and Operatic First. So it is all operatic covers of Beatles songs. And strangely enough, they called the album Revolution, even though the Beatles hadn't written the song Revolution yet. So, um, who knows? Maybe it inspired John Lennon to write a song called Revolution. Uh, I, I highly doubt that, but, you know, it would be fun if that were the case. But, uh, yeah, these are all, you know, she sings with a high operatic voice and sings all the Beatles songs. It's 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 uh, kind of hilarious. And uh, John, oh, this is a good record for uh, Exotica fans. In Expressions East, featuring the oud. An oud is a Middle Eastern stringed instrument, uh, and uh, featuring the oud of John Berberian. So an oud is maybe like kind of like the Middle Eastern version of a lute of a European lute or a Middle Eastern version of a Russian balalaika. It's a very interesting sound, and uh, normally in Middle Eastern music, when uh, musicians play the oud, there's a lot of these uh, improvis improvisatory, you know, improvisational guitar lines. Uh, well, except it's on the oud, not the guitar. But, uh, so uh, the oud of John Berberian. So if you like Middle Eastern sounds, this is good. Uh, and this is another a Middle Eastern rock.
So this is the same guy, John Berberian, and the Rock East Ensemble. And uh, I probably could use an upgrade on the cover, but I'm still very lucky to have this record. And uh, the title is written out on the belly of a belly dancer, so <laughs> really a little bit of a uh, risque cover. And, uh... oh my god, okay. This is a crazy record. So if you like uh, kind of outsider music or Christian music or stuff that's just plain weird, this is Father Pat Berkery, Prayers for a Noonday Church. So, um, you know, I have a general idea of what it's going for on Discogs. So it's, it's, it's getting to be an expensive record because it is popular. And it's popular because it's actually very good in a very strange way. I actually lucked out and was able to get a copy relatively cheaply because I bought, uh, so on eBay, sometimes people sell lots of records, like a lot. I, I, I don't mean a lot as in many, I mean L-O-T, like you sell a lot of things, that you sell a bunch of things instead of just one record. And so somebody on eBay, I found, was selling a bunch of Christian records. And buried in the collection of Christian records was this a record by Father Pat Berkery, which I was looking for because I knew it was collectible. And I was able to get the record cheaply because I was able to put a bid on a lot of Christian records, and this was hidden within it. And so sometimes it's worthwhile uh, bidding on a lot of records um, just to get the one really rare record in that lot. And so uh, that's how I got this record, uh, Prayers for a Noonday uh, Church. So uh, this is Father Pat Berkery. I believe he is an Episcopal priest, and he does these sort of like jazzy poetry slam spoken word bits while there's this psychedelic band uh, by the name of Spar uh, playing behind him, and it is absolutely insane. I mean, it's absolutely insane stuff. And he's, like, talking about, like, communion wine and, like, his hands turning into lobsters. And, uh, I, I, I don't know. Somebody put some LSD in the communion wine is what I think. But because of that, we have this record and the world is all the better off for it. Oh, my God. It's, it's, it's an incredibly bizarre record. And, uh, Let's see, here we go. Bermuda Jam. That's a psych record. Okay. Kind of a pop psych record. Oh, but this, this it is absolutely amazing. This record is amazing. So it's from the early 1970s, but it is actually more, more, more of a psychedelic. It's like from the mid 70s. Uh, 1977, so it's pretty late, but it has a psychedelic sound. So this is a privately pressed record that was put out by a couple named Roger and Wendy, uh, although under this uh, record they call themselves Bermuda Triangle, and uh, it has this uh, otherworldly sound. And there's this amazing uh, cover version on this record of Aerosmith's Dream On. It's like Aerosmith's Dream On, but it's like sung by a woman who sounds like Joni Mitchell, and she's strumming on her auto harp, and they, they've got all this other musical accompaniment to it. And it's absolutely otherworldly. It gives you chills up your spine. And it's, it's an amazing, um, it's an amazing uh, psychedelic record, very atmospheric. Lots of great uh, male-female vocal blends on it because Roger and Wendy were married, and it's just—it's like something that uh, exists out of time. Like it's like this shouldn't even exist because it's living in the wrong time period. So even when it was made, uh, it's just like the, if you get a chance to Google Bermuda uh, Triangle, Dream On. And just listen to it on YouTube. Just, just, just do it because you'll be glad you did. And uh, let's see, what else do we have in here? Oh my goodness! Oh, this is this is a great 
movie soundtrack, psychedelic movie soundtrack, one of the best, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls. A look at all those uh, beautiful women on the front cover. Uh, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls was the most successful movie of a director named Russ Meyer. Russ Meyer, uh, he started out in the 1950s making movies that were called Beauty Cuties. And uh, basically, he made movies that had a lot of women with really big breasts taking their top off. And so, uh, as you can see, <laughs> a lot of the women on the front cover of this record really have really large breasts, because that's who he cast in all of his movies. But uh, Beyond the Valley of the Dolls it was sort of a sequel to another movie called The Valley of the Dolls, but it is only a sequel in the loosest, very loosest sense of the term, and he got some really good, um, really good um, psychedelic bands like Strawberry Alarm Clock to appear on the record, but in addition to that, uh, the, uh, the protagonists of Beyond the Valley of the Dolls is an all-female rock band called the Carry Nations, and they have amazingly rocking, psychedelic songs that just, oh, they're, they're amazing, like really good drumming, and really propulsive, and just, um, and with like these big, big women's voices, and it's just really, really, really just, just a total 60s time capsule, and it is absolutely great. Uh, let me show the back cover. But yeah, and the, the guy with the mustache uh, next to all those women, that's Russ Meyer. Uh, so uh, if you can find any original no. Russ Meyer movie soundtracks, uh, that those are very, uh, very collectible. Um, and, okay, this one, this one, uh, it isn't, uh, so this is Big Brother and the Holding Company. So, not up on your rock and roll trivia, uh, uh, Big Brother and the Holding Company is mostly well known for uh, having Janis Joplin as its lead singer. But I think the group uh, doesn't get enough credit for being a regular band and not just Janis Joplin's uh, backup band. So this is their first record. Uh, it's a copy of the record I got on mainstream. Uh, records. I think it was actually given to me as a gift uh, by uh, my uncle Patrick, uh, believe it or not. And uh, but uh, I love the cover. It's a very you know very multicolored psychedelic cover. I would say so. Uh, uh, you probably know Big Brother and the Holy Company more for a another album called Cheap Thrills. So Cheap Thrills has this. Underground Comics cover on it, uh, written by, you know, uh, drawn by Robert Crumb, and it has the big hit uh, uh, for uh, Big Brother and the Holding Company, Take a Little Piece of My Heart, which was their only top 40 hit, uh, and, you know, and it's a good record, but I think this one, their first one, is, is underrated. Uh, it has like a, a really good psychedelic cut called Light is Faster Than Sound. Um, it has um, uh, Blind Man, uh, that's a good one. Uh, All is Loneliness, so that was a song by uh, Moondog. Uh, Moondog, a famous uh, avant-garde composer slash beatnik jazz guy slash homeless street musician who was very famous. Uh, among beatniks in the 1950s, and so the cover of Moondog song, which I think is pretty cool. And uh, so th this is uh, this is uh, uh, Janis Joplin's first group, Big Brother and the Holding Company. Uh, so if you're starting a psychedelic rec record collection, these two records are uh, both still relatively cheap and or easy to get. And this one, the first one, I think, is underrated. Uh, there's a lot of copies of it. It was released on both Mainstream and Columbia Records because of Janis Joplin's sudden fame. But 
even though there's a lot of copies of it, it's still, it's still, and it isn't like super rare or obscure, obscure, obscure. I, I think it's underrated and uh, people should get it. Um, so, let's see, where was I? Uh, so, Big Brother and the Holding Company. And... Uh, So here are three records by a band that has a big cult following. So it's the three original records by a big star. So I have Radio City and a third. Uh, this is uh, the, their third album that's sometimes released under the, the copy Sister Lovers. And this is Big Star. Big Star, uh, number one record. Uh, they didn't really have many hits uh, at the time that they were active. Uh, their lead singer uh, was Alex Chilton, uh, who was the lead singer of the Box Tops. There's also a famous song by the Replacements called Alex Chilton, which is in honor of the lead singer of, uh, of, the Box, of this guy, who's the lead singer of this group. Uh, there's also a, uh, it has In the Street, uh, which was the song used as the theme song for that 70s show. So, uh, there's, uh, and also, uh, September Girls, September Girls, I think is on this record. That's a very good, very good song by, um, Big Star. Uh, so, so I have, uh, copies of all the original, uh, Big Star records, and, and let's see. Big Star. Uh, Bill and Lisa. Uh, this is uh, another uh, lounge record I like. Uh, it kind of has some exotica sounds on it. And it also has a cover version of Aquarius on it. So I like it for that reason. And uh, let's see. Oh. Edwin Bird song. So this is a, you know, soul, funk, psychedelic record from the early 70s. Of the, so I like a lot of records that mix soul music or funk music and psychedelic music. And this is a very good, in that vein, Edwin Bird song. I think he's been sampled by Daft Punk uh, at least once. Uh, the, it's, it's like, it, it sounds a little bit like Lenny Kravitz, like Lenny Kravitz tries to do that soul psychedelic sound, but uh, this, is a, this is a guy that was sounding like Lenny Kravitz, but better in 1971 or 1972. So, very, very, look at him, look at him, look at him. He's, he's, he's in some really interesting getup. I think he's wearing, was he wearing Indian feathers or something like that? Like, anyway, he's wearing Indian feathers and beads and these, like, really dressed, really cool. And he's like, uh, like this, like he should have been this great uh, uh, soul funk psychedelic rock star, uh, you know, on the level of you know maybe George Clinton or something like that. But uh, uh, unfortunately, he's not well known. But Edwin Birdsong. Uh, so if you find any records by him, uh, that's a good one to pick up. What else do, oh, here. So this is not an original. The original would set me back quite a bit. So what is it? It's, it's Bjork. It's Bjork, but it's a record that Bjork did when she was about 11 years old. So this is a, I guess, a bootleg copy because it would be ridiculously expensive for me to buy an original of this. But uh, one reason I have it, partially, partially because it's Bjork as a little girl, and, you know, Bjork, I mean, still sounds like a little girl sometimes on some of her records, but this is when she was sounding like a little girl, because she was a little girl, and uh, the record is in Icelandic, so it's not in English, uh, but there, uh, uh, another reason I have it is it has a Beatles cover, it has a cover of The Fool on the Hill, uh, sung in Icelandic by an 11 or 12 year old Bjork. So, you know, how could, uh, I personally couldn't turn that down. I had to have 
something like that. Um, and oh, here. So uh, one of my favorite Beatles covers of all time is on this record, "Meet in a Black." Uh, she is a folk singer, and she has an amazing voice, and she has this. Uh, she does a version of Eleanor Rigby. She, uh, people do Eleanor Rigby is a very very sad song, and so when people cover it, they often make the song much much too happy. And what Anna Black did when she covered Eleanor Rigby is she made it dark and depressing and almost goth, like it's like from '66, but it sounds yeah. almost goth, like folk. So that's uh, Anna Black's uh, Eleanor Rigby uh, on Meet Anna Black. And I have, I have another Anna Black record, too. Because sometimes when you find out about somebody you've never heard of, like Anna Black, you have to buy the next record, uh, too, if you happen to find it. Um, and uh, this is... Uh, <laughs> I, I, this cover is just hilarious. It's 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 supposed to be Satan, like in nineteen seventies leisure wear. So it's a Stanley Black, Satan superstar. And uh, I mean, how can you not find this cover hilarious? Uh, and, it, and it has uh, the theme, the lullaby from Rosemary's Baby, uh, and some stuff from some other you know occult horror movies like Exorcist Two, The Heretic, and The Omens. But I mean. I, I just find this, this cover to be just completely hilarious. Stanley Black, Satan Superstar. <laughs> I'm still laughing. I'm still laughing. Anyway, uh, this one, this one's pretty rare. Uh, it's not in the best of shape, but it's uh, it's a psychedelic record. Uh, barbed Wire Sandwich uh, by Black Cat Bones. So, this is on PIP which is a, an offshoot of the Pickwick budget label in the United States. Uh, this was actually a, a British, one of those British, so in the late 1960s, as uh, Psychedelia was getting a little less popular, there was what was called the British Blues Revival, and there were a lot of these like hard blues rock bands. Uh, the early, early Fleetwood Mac was actually part of one of the part of that blues revival. And this is one of those, you know, hard rock British blues revival bands. Uh, so um, a lot of that sound is very influential on the Black Keys. So if you like the Black Keys, maybe you'd like early Fleetwood Mac or some of the other bands associated with that sound, like 10 Years After or Stone the Crows. Or, so uh, yeah, this is kind of like psychedelic meets British blues rock, blues rock revival. And I found this in a box of unalphabetized records for about four bucks, but it's worth a lot more these days. Uh, I'm really surprised, but uh, this was one where I got lucky. Um, and, uh, oh, yes. So, in an earlier video, I talked about the band The Animated Egg. And The Animated Egg uh, had some amazing psychedelic fuzz tone guitar instruments. Well, I told you that the songs of the animated egg were repackaged on a lot of different a lot of different records. So uh, black this is Black Diamonds and it's called a tribute to Jimi Hendrix. So at the time Jimi Hendrix died, there were a lot of albums that were released that were intended to cash in on the fact that Jimi Hendrix had died. And a lot of these records, because Jimi Hendrix was known for having like really distorted guitar sound, a lot of these cash-in records have a lot of distorted fuzz tone guitar sounds. But if you like that sort of thing, like I do, a lot of these records are actually really good. So, uh, in fact, yeah, it's, it's kind of a sub-genre of what I call exploito psychedelic or uh, psych exploitation, which are 
records that are, are meant to sound psychedelic, but they're not really made by a real band. They're made, basically made by a bunch of guys in the studio. Uh, and this was one of them. Uh, except in this case, they, they like took tapes that were already stolen and used for one record and repackaged them through this uh, Jimi Hendrix tribute record and maybe mixed in another song, mixed in a bunch of other songs so it didn't look like they were plagiarizing, but they were. And anyway, uh, but if you like that Jimi yeah. Hendrix distorted fuss on guitar sound uh, as an instrumental sound, this is a uh, good record. Uh, and then the last one in the bunch is Black Murder. Black Murder. Uh, this is another psychedelic soul record, and uh, so this is so this is like Black Diamonds or like in the Bird, Bird Song. Uh, it's it's in the psychedelic soul vein. Uh, so it's an all black uh, psychedelic. Uh, and they call themselves Black Murda, M-E-R-D-A. Uh, they also had, uh, they released another record, I believe, under the name just Murda, M-E-R-D-A. Uh, but uh, I can't, uh, I don't think I have a copy of that one. I can't vouch for that one. But this, this is good. This is good. Especially if you, and it's on uh, Chess. It's on Chess, which was historically an R&B blues label going back to the 1950s. But during the 1960s, they had to adapt with the times, uh, but they were still very much a black and black language label. So a lot of stuff from the late 60s on cadet and chess uh, has some really good psychedelic soul on it. So if you're into that kind of thing, the, uh, look for cadet and for chess, and uh, Black Murder is one of those groups. So uh, that's the last uh, record I have in the box. And I hope you like what you've seen so far. Thanks.